This is Kennedy Classics with Dr. D. James Kennedy. Welcome to Kennedy Classics. Welcome to Kennedy Classics. I'm Jerry Newcomb. And I'm Jennifer Kennedy Cassidy. Monday is the federal holiday on which we celebrate George Washington's birthday. In fact, you might be surprised to learn that though it's now commonly called President's Day, the federal holiday is still officially designated Washington's birthday. On today's program, you'll discover why he matters as much today as ever. George Washington, like all the Founding Fathers, was concerned about governmental abuse of power and turned away a number of efforts to make the office of the president more like that of a king. Yet, as we'll uncover later on today's program, our modern federal government and its leaders seek to accrue power at an alarming rate. And I'm John Sorensen. On President's Day, we celebrate the great leaders of American history. A little later, I'll tell you about a resource to help you follow the greatest leader of all. It was well known for the first 150 years of our country that George Washington was a man of great faith. But recent historians have tried to downplay that. As we begin today's program, my father, the late D. James Kennedy, looks at the real facts of history and not the politically correct version in his classic message, George Washington, the Christian. And now, if you would, would you turn to the first epistle of John. First John, chapter one, verse one. And may we hear the inspired word of our great God. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life, for the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. And may God speak to us this day through his holy word, and may his name ever be praised. Amen. When we consider the founder of this country, our first president, George Washington, whose character was considered by those that lived in his day to be the wonder of the age. The Duke of Wellington said that his was the finest character of our age, perhaps of any age. I think it's interesting uh, that Irving Kristol asked the question, whatever happened to George Washington? How many of you have read a positive article about George Washington in the newspaper recently. And we are told in various articles that I have seen that he was not virtuous, that he was not religious, that he was not even a Christian. 
He was a deist. And he certainly was not great. And so therefore, millions of paintings of the founder of our country, the father of our country, have silently disappeared because we have been made embarrassed by our own founding. And thus, we have been destroyed by the destroyers of greatness. Let's take a look, however, and see how true these things are. Was Washington a man of virtue and morality? Or was he, as the debunkers say, who seek only to say that virtue is a mask that covers hypocrisy because they know that they are hypocrites and have no real virtue and they cannot stand the fact that it actually might exist in somebody else. And so there are things that we hear, that he was not a virtuous man, that he never said, I cannot tell a lie, I cut down the cherry tree. Now it's interesting, he probably didn't say that. That's one of the myths that have grown up around him. But the interesting thing is that the character of George Washington was such that it supported the myth. And the myth could be believed because George Washington was the kind of man who probably would have done that as a boy. Which of us would find such a myth believed by many people? But there are other things. We are told that this man had an affair with a woman. Why, we not only were told it, we were told it in, in Technicolor by Hollywood. Isn't it interesting that during his lifetime and at his death, it was said that his character was the wonder of the world. And it waited for almost 200 years before Hollywood discovered that he really was nothing special at all. Isn't it interesting that those that knew him best saw his greatness, but those who never knew him at all can only see his weakness. Abigail Adams, who spoke her mind very clearly about most everything, said this, he was possessed of power, possessed of an extensive influence, and there is no doubt of that. Washington had more power and more influence than anybody in America and his day. But, she says, he never used it but for the benefit of his country. If we look through the whole tenor of his life, history will not produce a parallel. Thomas Jefferson, knew him well. And uh, Jefferson said of him that he was a man of phenomenal character and qualities, that his integrity was the most pure, his justice the most inflexible I have ever known, and that no motives of friendship or hatred were able to bias his decisions. He was indeed, in every sense of the word, a wise, a good, and a great man. Was he really a Christian? What did he truly believe in his heart? Well, let me tell you, one of the most amazing insights into the heart of the father of our country. On April 21st to 23rd, 1891, over 100 years ago, there was sold at auction in Philadelphia a remarkable collection of the personal possessions of George Washington, which had been in the hands of his family heirs for generations. Among them, there was found a little manuscript book, the most precious gem there, which contained 24 pages filled with handwritten, carefully scribed prayers 
in Washington's own hand, and this has been checked by handwriting experts, and uh, they are filled with beautiful, fervent, and evangelical language, the language of his, of his faith and his religious beliefs. Listen to these. We read today in the scripture about one who confesses his sins and is cleansed by the blood of Christ. Oh, most glorious God, in Jesus Christ, my merciful and loving Father, I acknowledge and confess my guilt. Ah, note well, Hollywood. You remember they created a mistress for him in the miniseries. And I talked to one of our great historians who, who specialize in this area, who told me that they made that up out of whole cloth. There's not a shred of evidence of truthfulness in it. Well, here's one they missed. Here, Washington is acknowledging his guilt. Take heed, Hollywood. You can make a new miniseries and present him as he really was with all of his faults. I confess my guilt in the weak and imperfect performance of the duties of this day. I have called on thee for pardon and forgiveness of sins, but so coldly and carelessly that my prayers are become my sin. Did you get that, Hollywood? His prayers are his sin. I wonder how many people here have ever confessed the sinfulness of their prayers. Maybe you've confessed the sinfulness of the fact that you don't pray, but how many of you the sinfulness of the coldness of your prayers? And they stand in need of pardon. His sin was a lack of what he perceived to be fervency in his own prayers. Or note this one. I humbly beseech thee to be merciful to me in the free pardon of my sins for the sake of thy dear son and only savior, Jesus Christ, who came to call not the righteous, but sinners unto repentance. Thou gavest thy son to die for me. And there are many, 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 many more. They are as evangelical prayers as are heard from the pulpit of almost any evangelical church in the world today. No, my friends, these are not the prayers of a deist. They are the prayers of a Christian. How desperately we need heroes in our nation today. May we pray. Father, may we be ashamed <clears throat> as we look at our own lives in the light of the life of the Father of this country. We thank thee, O oh God, that thou hast given to us and created for us such a man with such a faith, both in thy divine providence and thy beloved Son, in whose blood and merit he trusted for all things. O oh God, help us to be more like him as he followed thee. Bless our nation and call it back to godliness and faith and virtue. For Jesus' sake, amen. If you just prayed that prayer with Dr. Kennedy, then you have begun the greatest adventure that anyone can ever experience. And to help you get started, we want to send you Beginning Again, a book written by Dr. Kennedy for new believers. You'll learn how to pray, how to read and study God's Word, even how to witness to others. To receive Beginning Again, just write to our address or call our toll-free number. You can also log on to truthinaction.org. God bless you as you do.
In my father's message today, he shared some amazing truths about the Christian faith of George Washington that you might never have heard before. In a few minutes, we'll tell you how you can get a DVD bundle featuring this message and several other essential messages on some of our greatest presidents. The historical record shows that George Washington was a leader of unquestioned Christian integrity and humility. It was that humility, recognizing his own fallibility and the truth of the Bible, that caused him to want to put limits on the powers of government leaders, a desire shared by all the Founding Fathers from one degree to another. They viewed government as a necessary evil that should be strictly bound by the Constitution. But as you're about to see, Many of our leaders in our modern federal government have a much different view as they grab for ever-increasing power. Not many Americans know that a hundred years ago we didn't have an income tax in America. A hundred years ago, you know, the federal government in D.C. was pretty much a stranger. There was very few uh, functions of the federal government intruding upon the day-to-day -day lives of citizens. About the only interaction that most individual Americans ever had with the federal government was either they voted for president, senator, or congressman, or they would send a letter through the U.S. Postal Service, and uh, that was about it. Since the ratification of the federal income tax in 1913, more and more money has flowed from private hands to the government. The amount has become a flood. Most of the rest of the country, you know, experienced the Great Recession. Housing prices dropped, unemployment spiked. But here, inside the Beltway, we were pretty protected because the number one industry of Washington is government. And when times are bad, people who work in Washington are the beneficiaries. Former Senator Jim DeMint of South Carolina now heads the Heritage Foundation in Washington, D.C. Well, there has been no recession in Washington. The government has continued to grow. To have a little apartment here on the hill cost me more than my home back in Greenville, South Carolina. But it's just evidence of a government that is just taking more and more of the resources of the private sector, of the individuals, and bringing it here where we don't produce anything. And with this massive transfer of wealth to Washington over the past century has come a corresponding transfer of power. Ray Hederman, Jr. is director of the Center for Data Analysis at the Heritage Foundation. Fast forward to where we are today. You know, you get in the car you drive. The federal government is setting the standards in terms of gas mileage. Take a look at the energy you use, your water standards, your toilet size, how much electricity you know, washers and dryers are able to draw from. Take a look at the school food lunch program where the federal government is now trying to pick and choose the foods people eat. It seems there is nothing too insignificant for the federal government to seek to take power over. Ernest Hemingway left behind a six-toed cat named Snowball. In December 2012, for example, the government, after a lengthy and expensive battle in federal court, took authority over the famous six-toed cats at the Ernest Hemingway House in Key West. Undercover agents, plural, were sent down yeah. there to observe the cats. Nowhere in the Constitution can you find enumerated power for the federal government to assert authority over six-toed cats down in the Florida Keys. You know, we, we can laugh about that. It's pretty absurd. It's really funny. But there are other things that are not so funny. Dr. E. Calvin Beisner is the founder of the Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 13 that the government is God's servant to us for our good to execute vengeance on those who do evil and to commend those who do good. Beyond that, frankly, is not what God calls government to do. We might look, for instance, at giving government handouts to various businesses, subsidies to businesses. That only happens because the government takes money from some people to whom it belongs, who have earned it, and given it to other people to whom it didn't belong and who didn't earn it. Uh, you know, the, the, the Eighth Commandment does not say, you shall not steal unless you are the government. It just says, you shall not steal. I would argue that the government has no business uh, funding welfare programs, funding food programs, housing programs, any of that sort. That's not what God called it to do. 
Indeed, as many experts point out, there are very distinct dangers associated with government overreach. Everything that the state does, it does by force or at least the implicit threat of force. When the state encroaches, when it oversteps its bounds, there's always that potential for even lethal harm. Robert Knight is the senior fellow for the American Civil Rights Union. Government has an insatiable appetite for more power, and there are no natural checks on government except those that are written into our Constitution. The founders started with the notion that man is fallible. We're all sinners, so no one person should get too much power. So they divided it between the branches of the federal government and between the federal government and the states. But in recent years, the growth of government has exponentially increased. The government, because it has the legal monopoly of force, is far more dangerous than any private individual, any family, any church, any business. Because we're not angels, we need government, but because government employees, because government officials are not angels, they also need their limits. So the Bible explains God's purpose for civil government, which the founders understood. But does the Bible have anything to say about taxation? First Samuel chapter eight, when Israel demanded that they have a king so that they could be like the other nations, Samuel warned them that one of the things that this king would do was that he would demand of them 10%. And this was a warning. And when the state asks for the same percentage of our income that God asks for, the state is inherently assuming to itself, arrogating to itself, godlike status. At current levels, some Americans pay up to 60% of their income in local, state, and federal taxes. Experts point out there are also economic problems that come with tax-fueled government growth. All you have to do is look at Detroit. It's been controlled for over 50 years by the big government, high taxes, union-controlled, top-down management. The city's not only bankrupt, but you've got only 7% of eighth graders who read at the grade level. You've got over 400 liquor stores in the city, but no chain supermarkets. The population has decreased by almost two thirds over the last 50 years. It's just a wasteland, but it is a perfect example of what happens if you continue with the policies that we're seeing in Washington right now. So what can we do about runaway government? If I want to see government reformed, if I want to see it pushed back within its proper boundaries, the first thing I have to do is get my hand out of my neighbor's pocket. I need to get off of every kind of government handout that I can possibly get off of. The Lord Jesus said in Matthew 6.33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. If I have the kind of trusting relationship with God that God wants to establish with me, all right, then I don't have to trust the state instead of God. I don't become an idolater of the state. I don't begin to be dependent upon it. And I am willing, therefore, to live within the boundaries of what God does provide for me, rather than demanding something more. So really, the reformation of government begins with the reformation of my own heart. No nation on earth has been as free as America for as long as we have. For over 200 years, we've enjoyed tremendous liberty founded upon the God-given rights recognized in our Declaration of Independence and our Constitution. But sadly, there is now an entire generation of Americans that's ignorant of or even hostile to the Christian basis of our freedoms. Judges rewrite the Constitution and purge mention of God from the public square. Major political figures deny our Christian heritage, and the government takes over more and more aspects of our lives. That's why in this crucial election year, it's vital that you vote for leaders in the spirit of those like George Washington, 
who will uphold our Constitution as it was written, not as modern secularists want to reinterpret it. In the novel, 1984, George Orwell writes, who controls the past controls the future. Now think about it. We have millions of fellow Americans who know virtually nothing about our true history and the influential role the Bible played in our founding. As you've seen today, Dr. Kennedy taught these things passionately. And we've compiled some of his classic messages into a DVD bundle called The Bible and the Presidents. This four DVD set contains classic messages from Dr. Kennedy on some of the most important presidents America has ever had. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Abraham Lincoln. And we want to send it to you today when you give a generous gift to the ongoing work of this ministry. Simply write to us at Box 6053, Albert Lee, Minnesota, 56007, or call toll-free 877-942-7677, or go online to truthinaction.org. Revisionist history has tried to turn these men into secularists, but George Washington once said, that unless we learn to imitate Jesus Christ, we can never hope to be a happy nation. Thomas Jefferson said that our freedoms were not secure if we remove God as the basis for them. Abraham Lincoln read the Bible every day. It's essential that you have these truths contained in these DVDs for your children and grandchildren as well. And if you contact us right away, we'll also include the booklet, What They Believed, which includes written versions of these messages. We'll send you the four DVD set, The Bible and the Presidents, as well as the booklet, What They Believed, when you give a generous gift to the ongoing work of this ministry. Simply write to us at Box 6053, Albert Lee, Minnesota, 56007, or call toll-free 877-942-7677, or go online to truthinaction.org. Maybe you can give a gift of $30. Maybe you can give $50 or even $100 or more. Every gift is valuable as we seek to broadcast biblical truth on important issues like this through any means possible. Please contact us today. May God bless you as you do. And may God bless America. Next week on Kennedy Classics. How is America doing spiritually and morally? What important issues do we as Christians face? And how do we understand them from a biblical perspective? Unfortunately, there are those who are chipping away at religious freedom. These are challenging times for America. How do we live in a world that is increasingly intolerant of our Christian faith? That's next week on Kennedy Classics. A video of today's program is available on DVD for your gift to this ministry of any amount. So please call, write, or log on to our website today. This has been a production of Truth in Action Ministries.